Before we jump into today's video, I want to give a massive thank you to Easy Roller Dice for sponsoring today's video with their brand new Color Shift Dice Trays. Easy Roller's dice trays have always been wildly popular, in fact I think my buddy Billy has four of them, and uh, they're just frankly handy to have at the table. The new Color Shift Trays look incredible, and the Kickstarter has already doubled its original goals as of this video and begun to unlock all kinds of stretch goals, now like the new dice trays to complement your trays, new designs, and a lot more. So down in the description for this video, you'll find a link where you can go and check out this limited run for yourself. And when you use that specific link, it of course lets Easy Roller know that I sent you over, which is really a great way to help out the channel. So thank you Easy Roller Dice for being a part of the Taking 20 team. The Warlock is easily one of the most popular classes in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition, but we are a full six and a half years into D&D 5e now, and with the recent release of Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, we've been given new Warlock patrons and subclasses to play with. The only question that remains is, what is the best Warlock patron? What's the worst Warlock to play in 5e now? That's what we're going to talk about today as we have a little fun and break down all of the Warlock Patrons to separate the best Warlock from the very worst Warlock Patron. Now, before we get to our very first Warlock, we need to talk briefly about some of the ground rules, so to speak, the things that I'll be looking for. What's the criteria here? Right off the bat, each Warlock Patron grants four abilities, one at level one, level six, 10 and level 14. Additionally, each patron grants a unique spell list. Now, as I look over each of these abilities, what I am specifically looking for are usability. Are these features versatile or are they going to be rarely or even never used? Abilities that might be less powerful but still used every game session will carry maybe a lot more weight than the opposite. I'll also be looking for synergy. Do these abilities play well with others? AKA, if something stacks or fits nicely with your Warlock's pack or invocations, that will help its ranking. And finally, I'm looking for flavor. Look, this part is subjective, but I'm the boss here. You're allowed to disagree with me. Just know that, you know, you'll be wrong. All right, starting with the bottom of the barrel, we have our absolute worst of the worst. The Undying Warlock from Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide. Wow, there's really no nice way to put this. The Undying Warlock is hot garbage. Uh, it's no wonder we have a new Unearthed Arcana Warlock patron called the Undead, right? Okay, it's because even Crawford knows that this is just unsatisfyingly bad. I would argue that there are almost zero subclasses for any of the classes that aren't, at minimum, fine. I mean that. It's one of the great design features for Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. It's hard to play a bad character. But yeah, the Undying Warlock is, uh, it's, it's plainly terrible. Let's start off with the high point for the class, the spell list. Ray of Sickness, Blindness, Deafness, and Silence are all really decent spells. False Life and Speak with Dead are average and then it kind of drops off from there. Overall, the spell list is, I'd say, decent. At least the better spells come early and so we'll probably see some use during a campaign. Moving on to the rest of the ratings, we have Among the Dead at level 1, which lets us pick up Spare the Dying and give some subpar protection against Undead. Defy Death at level 6, which lets us pass a single death save and bounce back up. Undying Nature at level 10, which is the second worst ability among all the Warlock patrons. And Indestructible Life at 14, which lets you regain 1d8 plus Warlock level in hit points one time until you stop and rest. There isn't a single ability that really synergizes with any of the rest of this class, and the only thing that will cause people to play this, or to look twice at this class, is the flavor. Which I personally think is, is pretty dope, uh, and really the only thing that I like about this class, other than the fact that it gets silence on its spell list. Absolutely deserving of our bottom spot here. The Undying Warlock is truly awful, and if you play it because you like the flavor, I won't think any less of you, because we'll both know that you are quite literally handicapping yourself for flavor, which is fine. But uh, yeah, the Undying uh, is bad. <laughs> Moving on to number seven, we have the Archfey Warlock from the Player's Handbook. This is the very first Warlock patron uh, listed in the PHB for fifth edition, and uh, yeah, it definitely feels like it. I feel like the Archfey was the Wizards of the Coast idea for how to like block out a wizard class during their design process. It feels like they gave it one great ability and then kind of panicked trying to overcompensate to have everything else be subpar to average at best. 
Again, starting out with the spell list, we have easily one of the better spell lists among the Warlock patrons. Sleep, which I always think is underrated, Phantasmal Force with some really good flavor, Plant Growth, which is also underrated, uh, and a gem, both dominates, and Greater Invisibility. Overall, this spell list is, it's great. It's a great spell list. But let's move over to the rest of the ratings and we can see the whole story as we have Fey Presence at level one, which is the most disappointing ability for any of the classes, I think, from the standpoint of it could have and should have been just a little bit better and it would have been fine. FYI, if you want to homebrew this, I change it from one single round to rounds equal to half your warlock level rounded down and a save every turn, or you could leave it as is, but let them do it a number of times equal to proficiency per rest as and cast as a bonus action. Either way, if the players choose this, I would recommend you tweak it just a little bit because it, it really needs it. Then at level six, we get an absolute bomb with Misty Escape. I counted only four other Warlock abilities better than this for all the other patrons. And how do we follow that incredible ability up? With the single worst ability among all the Warlock patrons with Beguiling Defenses at level 10. This ability is basically wait the entire campaign for a creature to attempt to charm you, then you can attempt to charm them back. But they, in turn, still get to save, and if you do charm, it's only for 60 seconds. Notice how this one is only charmed, unlike the other abilities which say charmed or frightened. It's terrible. And then, of course, we have Dark Delirium at level 14, which has a lot of flavor, but mechanically is perfectly average. Again, like the Undying, the Archfey doesn't have a lot of synergies. It wants to be a pure caster, but Fey Caster and Misty Escape are designed more for when things get too close. And for flavor, my gut reaction is just meh. It's got some cool ideas in there with the charm stuff, but it's all executed so poorly that really the best parts of this patron are just the spells, which aren't really that flavorful. Any wizard could just take these exact same spells and, and have the exact same flavor. Coming in at number six on our list is the Great Old One from the Player's Handbook. To be honest, there isn't much space separating the Great Old One at six and the Archfey at number seven. The Great Old One has a very strange pattern to it, and depending on your campaign length, the Great Old One might be better than most of the other subclasses, as it starts off quite strong and then progressively gets worse from there. For the spell list, we actually get a bit of a crossover with the Archfey, but with the spells being a little darker. And in my opinion, the Great Old One spell list is, it might be the best spell list of all the Warlock patrons. In fact, there isn't a single spell that I dislike here. The worst spell on this list is probably Clairvoyance. And even that is a great spell. Dissonant Whispers, Sending, Dominate Beast, Dominate Person, Telekinesis, all of these are simply excellent to outright bombs. Sliding over to the abilities and our ratings, we start off with a fantastic ability at level one with Awakened Mind. I know a lot of people will say that I am overrating this ability a little bit, but I assure you guys, this ability is incredibly powerful in the hands of a truly creative player. Unlimited telepathic communication for any language within 30 feet is so, so good. Then we get a decent ability with Entropic Ward at level six. It's instant disadvantage on attack against you, which checks our box of being very usable though it's once per rest. At level 10, we get Thought Shield. This has a very useless ability that probably hasn't been relevant in 99.99% .99 of Dungeons Dragons 5th Edition games. And then it also gives us resistance to psychic damage, which, uh, you know, it's still situational. Then finally at level 14, we get Create Thrall. I'm not a fan of this ability. The best thing it's going to do is let you knock an NPC out and then charm them. But this isn't do the Dominate spell, right? They're just charmed which means you interact socially with them a little better. And while I could see this being a fun ability when and if you do pull it off in a campaign, it's just not that much of a relevant ability in most games that you're going to end up playing. Synergy-wise, I think this patron has actually a lot of roleplay uh, potential synergy. There are a lot of fun invocations that you can pair with the ability to communicate telepathically. Shroud of Shadow and Mask of Many Faces come to my mind immediately, but, you know, maybe not a lot beyond those types. And for flavor, uh, you know, I don't know. This is a little hit and miss for me. The dark stuff, the spell slots, cool. 
But being given special powers from Cthulhu isn't really my thing. I mean, I guess it's cool from the player side, but as a DM, I like to tie in my players' backgrounds when and where it makes sense. You show up with Cthulhu, I mean, that's fine, but just know that when it's your turn to get a little DM spotlight love from me, I'm probably not looking at this patron. You know, I'll be looking at your mother, your father, your sibling rivalry, stuff well before I look at Cthulhu. It doesn't mean that you won't get the spotlight, it's just that this patron will probably be a little taxing to incorporate into every D&D campaign that somebody takes this particular warlock. Moving on to number five, we have the Fiend Warlock from the Player's Handbook. The Fiend Warlock isn't the strongest warlock in the game, but it's not the weakest either. It's comfortably in the middle. And I think its abilities even seem to kind of echo that a little bit. Starting off with their spell list, I think it falls right in between being good and great. Nine of the 10 spells are usable in literally any D&D session. And the last spell, Hollow, is still good, though admittedly situational. The weakest thing on this list is Command, and that's pretty impressive because I like the Command spell. I wish more people would try wacky things with it. As a Dungeon Master, I promise, I will err on the side of my players when they impress me with their cleverness at the table and using command in a fun, quirky way is something that I'm gonna try to lean into and let them get away with. Now, sliding over to our ratings, we have an ability at level one that reads a lot better on paper than it is in use with Dark One's Blessing. Getting temp hit points when we kill things sounds awesome, but unless you get all the killing blows all the time, it's not gonna do much. At level six though, we get a much better feature with Dark One's own luck. This lets us grab an extra D10 on an ability check or saving throw, and we get to do it after we roll. This is almost a bomb, but I'd like to see the times we get to use it be a little bit higher to, to really make it fall into that category. At level 10 and 14, we have perfectly average abilities with Fiendish Resilience and Hurl Through Hell. There isn't much to say about these. Choosing a resistance beforehand might be good or you might pick wrong and have it be worthless. Hurl Through Hell, admittedly, might be the coolest ability for the Warlock, but you know, it's fine. Great against single targets, bad against lots of minions. Okay, Synergy. Well. Uh, yeah, there isn't much to say here, <laughs> which isn't the worst thing. I mean, all the stuff that this Warlock gets kind of just works on its own, but it certainly doesn't boost any packs or invocations really that much. There's not a lot synergy-wise going on. For flavor, I'm going to describe it with one word, expected. It's like exactly what you would expect. It has that devil, demon, fiend, deal-making vibe to it. The spells are all fire heavy with command and blindness deafness. Steal health from someone if you take their life. Like, the flavor has the same flavor as really any show on the CW for the past 25 years. It's perfectly average and why this comes, you know, kind of right here in the middle of the pact. See what I did there? Moving on to our top half, we have the fathomless warlock from Tasha's Cauldron to everything here at number four. Diving right into the spell list. We get this sort of hit or miss selection of spells with a few duds like Create Water and Gust of Wind, but also some incredible spells with Silence, Lightning Bolt, Sleet Storm, and Bigsby's Hands. Overall, I'd probably rate this slightly, and I mean slightly below average. Jumping over to the ratings for our abilities, we actually snag two separate features at level one with Gift of the Sea, allowing us to just straight up breathe underwater and Tentacle of the Deep, which is a bomb, turning us into a Gatling gun with minute long bursts. So an entire combat, a number of times per day equal to our proficiency modifier. At level six, we get two more features, Oceanic Soul, which is a decent permanent resistance to cold, and we get Guardian Coil, which lets our Tentacle of the Deep suddenly start reducing damage as a reaction to ourselves or our allies every single turn at range, no less, and it grows to a 2d8 at level 10. Frankly, this is just an incredible, incredible ability. At level 10, we grab Grasping Tentacles, which is a cool version of Everett's Black Tentacles once a day. And at level 14, we get Fathomless Plunge, which lets us use a one mile teleport spell at level 14, you know, to, to, a, to, a, body, to a body of water. Still pretty cool. As for Synergy, this class plays the long range damage dealer very well and easily synergizes with several invocations and warlock abilities. And if we're talking about flavor, 
I think this Warlock Patron has the best flavor available. Everything here is tightly connected, and if you play this class, you're going to feel a bit like Aquaman. Even the listed patrons aren't impossible for your DM to drag into the game's side arcs with things like the Kuotoa gods and Seahag Covens as just some of the examples. In my opinion, this is probably going to be, honestly, my first Warlock. You know, you know, if I, if I like, ever get to play again. <laughs> Coming in at number three, we have the other warlock from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything with the Genie Warlock. Let's jump into the spells because this thing is a little chaotic. The way this works is that every genie warlock gets six generic genie spells starting with detect evil and good up to a unique level nine wish spell. Then depending on which genie element you go with, you get five more from those lists. Probably the most obvious choice here would be the Afridi spells, as they're really just a bunch of I throw fire at it to death spells, you know, which will be useful. The other spell lists are fine, but overall, with the exception of Wish, the best spell in the game, I'd say the spell lists are surprisingly a little below average again. I mean, you can't have an average without something being at least, you know, below average, right? Now, let's slide over to the features and ratings with our first ability, Genie's Vessel. This comes in two parts. The Bottle Respite feature, which is just, well, you know, lame and boring. And, and the Genie's Wrath feature, which is a permanent extra bit of damage equal to your proficiency mod. This is a very average ability, in my opinion. From there though, everything gets much better. At level six, we get Elemental Gift and pick up both resistance to the elemental portion of the genie we chose, and we get to, you know, just fly. That's right, we fly now, 10 minutes at a time. We can't lose concentration like a spell from it either. We can't get our wings tied up and fall from the sky. We just straight up fly as a bonus action. Oh yeah, and it's a number of times per day equal to our proficiency mod. At level 10, we snag Sanctuary Vessel, which uh, I'm gonna be honest, feels like cheating. Short rests are now just 10 minutes. You can pull the whole squad in. They get bonus healing if they spin hit dice. Just in case you don't remember, by the way, Warlocks get all their spells back on a short rest, which is now, you know, only 10 minutes. And because you and your entire party can now short rest in, you know, 10 minutes. And there is no cap on how many times you can short rest in a day in the player's handbook. Now at level 14, we get our first 10 out of 10 abilities with limited wish. Cast any level six spell or lower in the game. Wait 1d4 days to do it again. For creative players that are also experienced players, this is the best thing they could ever dream of. But it's also a level 14 ability and not every campaign will ever even go that high, which is you know probably why the, the Genie Warlock ultimately ended up at number three, despite having two of probably the best three Warlock abilities in the entire game. Okay, two of the best four, half. Okay, quickly on to synergy, and I would say that the genie actually has a lot of flexibility, and so has quite a bit of synergy with many packs and invocations here that work really well. I would rate its synergy capabilities as great. Now, for flavor, uh, I'm gonna be a little controversial here and say ah, it's kind of campy and a little boring. I mean, we get it. You get one element and you have a bottle you get to sleep in. Not really my cup of tea personally, but you know, campy means some people will be totally into it. Cinderella's Castle at Disney World is campy, but take a six-year-old girl there and she's going to love it. The original Dragon Ball was campy and a little raunchy, but I loved watching it in my 30s. <laughs> I may not be into the genie, but I can recognize others definitely will be. Moving on to our runner-up, we have the Celestial Warlock from Xanathar's Guide to Everything. In all truth, it was incredibly hard for me to keep this out of the top spot because I personally feel this Warlock is probably in the overpowered category a bit. It's hard to just look at how many powerful things it gets and compare them as a whole to the paltry, undying Warlock. Now, diving into the spells, we get what I would call a solid spell list. Of course, the Celestial Warlock is built around healing and radiant damage. Cure Wounds is great, Revivify is great, even Flaming Sphere is pretty good. Guardian of Faith is usually one of my favorite level four spells in the game, but it does feel a little clunky on the Warlock as it won't truly upcast. And that's kind of, you know, the whole point to the Warlock at its core, but still a very, very solid spell list here. All right, now over to the features for the Celestial Warlock. Right off the bat, and one of the reasons this Warlock is ranked so high, we get an absolute bomb healing light at level one. This is basically healing word on crack. 
If you appreciate the math behind the spell healing word and why it's so broken, you will love this ability. The only reason this ability isn't considered downright broken is because of how limited we are on spell slots as a warlock. If we had more spell slots to generally heal, this ability would have never made it into the game as is. It's that good. But because we need to really rely on it as our core healing engine, it's still a 10 ability, but not straight up broken. Or, you know, maybe it is. Lots of classes can heal in 5e, and if you're not the sole and only healer in your party, uh, yeah, this thing is gonna feel broken as hell. At level six, we snag Radiant Soul to pick up resistance to radiant damage, which is probably useless. But then we also get our Charisma mod as a flat static damage on all radiant or fire spells, uh, which is very good. Level 10, gives us Celestial Resilience, which is like starting every short rest off with 25 to 70 additional temp hit points between you and your party, depending on your level. And finally, Searing Vengeance comes at level 14, which guarantees that if your party all drops to a big AoE attack like a Dragon's Breath Weapon, you can pop back up and start healing party members to prevent the incoming death saves. Very strong for these last levels of an epic campaign. I think the Celestial Warlock has some great synergies for the base Warlock class features. For those Warlock players who want to take the Agonizing Blast invocation, you now get the chance to replace it as you level up seamlessly once you hit level six for Radiant Soul. Same for Fiendish Vigor. And for flavor, I think this is sort of a double-edged sword. First off, the Celestial Warlock's flavor is solid. It clicks, right? It certainly feels dis like a distinctive variant of, of the Warlock that isn't going to feel like any of the others. All the abilities work together in a cohesive way to allow this Warlock to feel like the flavor is certainly its own thing. This sort of righteous Warlock that hurls healing and radiant fire damage. But in my opinion, that thing is so far from a traditional feel to the Warlock, you know, that it might be just a bit too much of a leap in the other direction for my taste. You know, maybe the biggest reason this got edged out for the top spot was because its core best ability heals people. When you think Warlock, someone who has all but sold their soul, or in some cases, they might have even done that, for gifts and powers beyond what normal mortals are capable of, your first instinct is probably not a unicorn, which is one of the examples given to us by the game designers. That's all I'm saying. And so, adventurers, that brings us to our top spot for today's ranking of the worst Warlock patron to the very best in all of Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. That's right, it's the Hexblade Warlock from Xanathar's Guide to Everything. When I got ready to dive into the research portion for this video, I thought, surely, surely, there will be something else that will knock off the Hexblade Warlock. I mean, I earnestly had hoped something else would really be able to slide in here, but the truth is, there can be absolutely no doubt at just how powerful this thing really is. Let's start, per usual, with the spell list. I'm gonna give this an ultimate rating of average. Everything on the spell list is good, but nothing is a powerhouse. You get a bunch of smites, but since we're warlocks and our spell slots curve up as we level, Early spells like Wrathful Smite, which I think is a pretty decent spell early, loses all its appeal as it cannot be upcast. Though I will admit, every spell feels like a small power gain at the levels in which you pick them up. It's just, they sort of fizzle out a little bit as you grow and level. Now, let's talk about why this particular Warlock is the premium patron of the bunch, and look at the features. Starting at level one, we get two abilities. One that is very good, and a second that just about breaks the f***ing game. This first, of course, being Hexblade's Curse, which is a very good ability on its own, it's great. It gives us a minute-long curse against a single target to increase our damage, crit range, and some life leech. If this was able to be cast a number of times equal to our Charisma mod, it would be a perfectly fine ability for pretty much any of the classes in the game. But then, we also pick up, arguably, the best subclass ability in all of Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. I mean that with Hex Warrior. In short, what this does is allow us to use our Charisma mod when fighting instead of Strength or Dex. This is an absolute bomb of an ability and why so many Charisma classes love taking a level one dip into Hexblade. The truth is, the Warlock and classes like the Paladin and even the Bard are a bit mad. Now, I don't mean mad like the British colloquialism for crazy. I mean mad as in multiple attribute dependent, aka they need a lot of their abilities to have decent to good scores. 
By allowing us to completely dump strength if we want, this does so many additional little things. It lets us max out our two hit and melee damage as a fighter would, while also maxing out our spell DCs. It lets us put those extra points into constitution so we maintain concentration, increase our base hit points, and have better saving throws against a flesh to stone spell. We could spend those points on wisdom for better saves against polymorph and better passive scores so we don't start combat with the surprise condition. Or or we can even put more into decks, improving initiative, saves, and our AC. So now we have a high spell DC, high armor class, and can dole out significant martial weapon damage. Oh yeah, and we can still snipe from huge distances with our Eldritch Blast, which scales at level. All of this is just a level one ability. Level one, right off the bat, right from the beginning, level one. The very first session, we get all of this. That's why many DMs don't allow multi-classing with the Hexblade. Take all of this with just one level and put that on a class with extra attack like the Paladin or Valor Bard, and there are few things your character won't be able to do. Now, at level six, things do cool off a little with a Cursed Spectre, which lets you convert a slain enemy into a Spectre. You know, just in case you're into that kind of stuff. Very cool for a few levels but not terribly great after level 10 or so. In combat, anyways, the roleplay portion is really always awesome. Kill an orphan and turn them into a specter to get the town to pay up a tribute. You know, seems legit. <laughs> and uh, at level 10 though, we get another bomb, which gives us a way to basically tank boss fights if you like 50-50 rolls to make them just outright miss you. As if we needed to add tank to our CV, or you know, resume as we call it here in North America. I'm sorry, I've just been rewatching a lot of Taskmaster recently, so uh, no spoilers for the Lee Mack and Mike Wozniak Series 11. I'm serious about a Banhammer, guys. No spoilers. The tall mother with the ivory hair, <laughs> I think is the nicest thing anyone's ever seen. <laughs> And finally, at level 14, we get a decent feature, Master of Hexes, which comes a little bit late, but lets us bounce our hexes around like Hunter's Mark, so even this, eventually, is pretty useful. Synergy here is off the chart. I'm just gonna leave it at that. And flavor, damn, it's awesome too. You can find a dope sword from the Shadowfell that grants you dark and deadly powers. Did someone leave it for you to find? Did you make a deal for it? And my goodness, all the abilities tie in so nicely together. Even lawful good paladins could still serve their deities and be tricked into accepting a sword as a gift or maybe even seek out their weapon as a way to better serve their deity. Like uh, buying a Faster car for your pizza delivery job, right? Absolutely oozing flavor. And in my opinion, flavor that seems to fit the motif of what it means to be a warlock better than perhaps the Celestial does, you know, with their unicorns. But wait, there is one more warlock patron out there that I haven't talked about much. The undead warlock, which as of this video is currently in Unearthed Arcana still. I'm not gonna delve too much into it as UA classes are apt to change, but for those of you curious, as it sits right now in early 2021, I'd slot it right in between the Fiend and Fathomless and put it at number five, pushing the others back one slot in the overall rankings. I'm curious to see when and if this thing will make it to the game officially and when it does, what the final version will ultimately look like. And so now I wanna pass it over to you guys in the community. Uh, what did I get right? What did I get wrong? I'm sure, I always say that. What did I get right, what did I get wrong? And then all people say is, I don't like this, I don't like this, I don't like this. Nobody goes like, yeah, you got it. That was it, that was perfect. Um, <laughs> so let me know what, what I got right, what I got wrong, what you guys think I rated too highly, what you guys think I was a little too harsh on. Let me know in the argument section down below. If this is your first time here and you love role-playing games as much as I do, or you're learning to love role-playing games as much as I do, I'd love to have you subscribe. I put out videos on GM tips, player tips, tutorials, and more stuff just like this. So if that sounds like something you might be interested in, just hit the subscribe button down below and come join us, or check out the Taking 20 Discord. We have a massive, many thousands of people community, uh, and uh, yeah, you can find games, you can ask questions, all kinds of stuff. Link to that is in the description box below. I, of course, want to give a massive thank you to my patrons over at welcomeadventures.com. Guys, it's because of you I'm able to do this, so thank you so very much. I hope you guys enjoyed David's map this month. It was awesome. And uh, so, yeah, uh, if you guys like what I do here, you want to support the channel and pick up some extra rewards for yourself, like maybe popping in a one-on-one -on -one meeting with me, you can do that over at welcomeadventures.com. Thank you guys so much for watching. My name is Cody, and may your games be filled with awesome memories and even
better friends. I'll catch you guys next time. Yeah.